Sarah, 1926, Tyler, Texas. Let's go back there. What do you remember when you were just a little girl? I remember I was one of four girls, and I was very close to my younger sister. We lived in a little in a house, and we had two double beds for the four girls. And I shared a bed with my sister Marilyn. We were just brought up frugally, and but it was always fun. It was a wonderful home life. What was the name of your other two sisters? Marilyn was the one I was so close to. Right. Ruthie was the younger one. The, we called her Baby Ruthie and that, because she was the shy one. The four girls were in steps, like a step ladder. We had pictures, and they had to erase the baby, baby Ruthie's hand was holding on to mother's skirt, <laughs> and they had, the hand is out here. Yeah. And what was your other sister's name? Fanny was my older sister, who I lost two years ago. I'm sorry. And, um, uh, then, so that made me the the matriarch of the family. There you go. There you go. <laughs> what, did, what did your dad do for a living? My father came from Poland, Suwalki, Poland, and came over to Galveston. And when you see Hester Street and all the movies, right. this is my father. And he came here without his parents. Jews were... Uh, oppressed in Poland right. and my grandmother kissed him goodbye got him on a ship and he came to America did he ever get to see them again yes they brought mother Bubby over here okay. Okay. she didn't like it she said I can't adjust I want to go home and she went back home. And of course, when Hitler, oh. during the uh, Holocaust, she died, she was killed. Oh. And, uh, but daddy, and he had two brothers. And the older brother was, went to Mexico and settled in Mexico City and became very, very successful. And uh, he was the one who brought Daddy over, mm -hmm. and he that so that was how. And the younger brother settled in New York. What business was your daddy? During World War II, there was a army camp near Tyler called Camp Fannin, and Daddy from a little jewelry shop. Someone came in and said, "I need money." Anyway, he became a pawnbroker. Wow. And that's how he became money, because he would, but always fair, and ha always had a special spot, always very, when Jewish soldiers would come in, take them home for dinner. Uh -huh had to come home. He's, everybody had to get a square, a home-cooked meal. Did your mom like that? Oh, mother loved it. Yeah, yeah. Mother loved it. My mother was not in great health. She had a lot of health issues. When I was two years old, mother developed tuberculosis. Mm. And that was, at that time, there was no penicillin. There were no antibiotics. The one treatment was to go to Denver to the hospital and let the climate, the cold cl climate, cure you. And that's what she did. And my father, there was only my sister and I at the time. We didn't have the two younger ones. And so my father was both father and mother. He had a maid in the house, Ethel. And the maid did the cooking and kept the clothes and looked after Fanny and I. But 
Daddy was, and I guess I never realized it before. I think that's one of the reasons I've always, I was always so close to my father. The depression, you were a young girl. Did you remember, did it affect your family at all? Yes. My father, in the store, had an old coin collection. And at times, he would take some of the old coins, cash them in at the bank for money to buy milk. Mm. So Ethel would have uh, the groceries for Fanny and I. Now, where did your dad um, meet your mom? In Tyler. Oh, so your mom was here? No, she came over when she was 16 years old. Did they know each other? No. Okay, and she but came from Poland also? Also, Cora Chin, a little village, a shtetl in Poland. They didn't know each other at all. But mother had an older sister. They called her Mrs. B. Mm -hmm. And she was one of these big, buxom, domineering, wonderful she owned, and everybody in her family recognized this was the matriarch. And she had a fish market and grocery store in Tyler. There were no other Jewish delicatessens or places to buy anything kosher, nothing. Aunt Bibi. Everybody called her Aunt Bibi. Um, had the kosher delicatessen, and uh, so and she always saw to it. My when father when my father came to Tyler, first of all when he landed, he sold Liberty magazine on the corner for a nickel a copy. So when he came to Tyler. He was selling magazines, doing whatever he could do. And then somebody told him, enlist in the army. Tell him you're a cook. You'll get three meals a day. You'll be in the kitchen. You will never be hungry. And with the background he had of being hungry, mm -hmm. that's what he did. What, what year was this? You know, or uh, World War I. World War One. So was your dad, did he see combat in World War I? No. He was a cook. Yeah. That's all he saw. Yeah. Was And never went to Europe. Then when he was discharged, he was discharged at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. Made his way to Tyler. And Aunt Bibi saw this good-looking Jewish boy. <laughs> fed him. And have I got a girl for you? I knew you were going to say. And have I got a girl for you? And sure enough, he met my mother, and that was it. And I have pictures of their wedding, my mother and my father. And I always, they always said I looked like my father. Mother had a lot of illnesses, that tuberculosis that sent her away to. Denver and daddy was working in the store and this was during the depression right. very difficult I'm sure. very difficult times now tell me about uh, your grandparents on the other side that would be Leon Phillips and daddy's mother's name and escaping me where'd you go to grammar school Gary Elementary Wonderful, and in Tyler, everything was near. Right. And I remember Gary Elementary, and then we had a middle school, and then Tyler High. And when we, the family, as we did better, as Daddy did better, we moved to Broadway Street, and this was the house with nice house and years later I'm in the Temple Emmanuel Choir and the temple in, choir, in Bethel in Tyler asked us to come and sing a Friday night service. We rented the bus. When the bus came from Dallas by Broadway Street 
I screamed, that's our house. <laughs> that's where I was brought up. The choir loved it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know? Yeah. Now, where did you go to high school? Tyler High School. What was high school life like for you? I was very studious. I graduated valedictorian. I was very strong student. I used to play the violin. I was a music major. Always loved music. I didn't continue with it because to be a music major in college you had to put in hours of practicing. Violin was my instrument. I didn't continue with it. Instead I switched majors. When I graduated high school, Tyler High, I went to University of Colorado for one semester. In my mind I thought if I go there, maybe the family would move to Denver and that would so help my mother. It would give her the only treatment to keep her alive and well. But it didn't work that way. Daddy couldn't financially swing it. Nor the roots were in Tyler. He couldn't bring himself to make that move. My mother was sick. But she was a fierce businesswoman and very smart. She and Daddy talked over everything. And she told Daddy pretty much what to do. Mm. She's a very astute woman. How did World War II affect your family? My family was very religious. There were two Jewish girls in my senior class and no Jewish boys, and my family would not let me date a non-Jewish boy. So I didn't have a date to my senior prom because my, family, my parents said, you're not going to date out of the faith. Right. But in high school, I was chosen one of the ten most beautiful girls of the class and we walked across the stage in an evening dress but I didn't couldn't go to my senior prom when did you meet your husband okay I went down to the University of Texas and his sister was my sorority sister at University of Texas I went to the University of Colorado half a year I was, times were different. You didn't pick up a phone and call home. My family couldn't afford that. Mm -hmm. I could call home once a week. Right, right. So I talked to mother and daddy on Sunday. Right. Everybody was wonderful to me up there. I cannot tell you the friends. My roommate at the university lived in Denver. We went to Denver every weekend. They were so good to me. But I missed my family. Mm -hmm. I missed them all. I had an A average in college even. But I wanted to go home. So we transferred everything to Tyler Junior College. Mm -hmm. And I picked up and finished that and another year, so I got a degree from Tyler Junior College. Okay. In the When I was a senior in high school, I played the drums and was in the marching band. Down at the university, when I first came, I had a sorority sister. I joined a Jewish sorority, and my sorority sister lived in Dallas. So... Also, my own sister lived here. I came to visit my sister, and I called. My sorority sister had just gotten engaged, so I called to congratulate her. A man answered the phone who was later to become my father-in-law, and I chatted with him a minute, and then I said, could I speak to Ducky? That was her right. name. My husband, Marvin, 
she would paddle in the water and he said, look at the ducky, ducky, ducky. And he nicknamed her Ducky and it stuck with her. Her real name was Adele, but the name stuck with her. Anyway, he gave me the phone to say to hello to Ducky. That evening, my father-in-law, Jack Yaron, said to Marvin, who later became my husband, he said, I had a conversation with a young woman on the phone today, a young girl who had the sweetest voice and she was ch really, she sounded so nice. You know what? Why don't you call her? She's visiting for a few days. Why don't you take her out? And you know what the answer was? I wouldn't be caught dead with one of my sister's friends. He was five years older. I wouldn't be caught dead. And my father-in-law blew up. You know it all. You are such a smart... I won't say what he said. But he said, you know it all. You've never met the girl. You don't know what she looks like. You've never talked to the girl. So he says, don't get excited. I don't want you to have another heart attack. I'll take the dog out. If Ducky and her fiancé will go with us, that way I'll have somebody to talk to. Right. Calls me back and said, could we go to the Majestic Theater? We're going to the music. The Majestic Theater on Elm Street. And the four of us. So he picks up Ducky and Bob. They lived on Bryn Mawr in the... And my sister was still in South Dallas visiting there. So she, they, he picked them up and they, the three of them came and got me. We went to the movies. When the movie was over, instead of dropping the dog in South Dallas, which was near the movies, they couldn't figure it out. Why is he taking Ducky and Bob back to Bryn Mawr before taking me home. But that's what he wanted to do. And after he dropped them off, on the way home, he swings around White Rock Lake and parks the car. And he looks at me and he says, you know, I'm going to marry you. And my words to him were, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. Three months later, we were married. What, what changed your mind? He said, you'll see. So how long are you here in Dallas for? And I said, I'm going home tomorrow. I'm driving back to Tyler, my ride. By the time I got home, it was a Friday. He already had called the Blackstone Hotel in Tyler, had a reservation at the hotel. He arrived Friday night, stayed Saturday, Sunday drove back, Sunday night, every night, six o'clock, he called me wherever I was. Please reconsider. Stay in Tyler, Dallas. Don't go back to school. Let's get engaged. We will get married. I said, no, I've got one year left. I was already in orange jackets. Had a lot of things going for me. The vice president of my sorority had already moved into the sorority house. A lot of things on the front burner. They talked me into it. And I've never regretted it. So where did you guys settle down? Dallas. And what, and what did Marvin do for a living? He was in business with his father. J&M Appliance Company was the name of the business. And at this point, my father-in-law was already sick. So Marvin was running the business. And my sister-in-law, Ducky, was engaged. And her husband came into the business. So it, the business was still called Jack J&M. Jack and Marvin. It was appliance at that point, but soon after, Marvin was 
extremely creative and very, very sharp, very high IQ. And television was just coming in and he and Bob got an offer to be distributors of Packard Bell mm -hmm. TV. They brought that in, started being distributors. The business grew. Amana Microwave, he demonstrated the first microwave at Sanger Harris in Preston Center. It's very creative. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we were married two months and Ellen was on the way. First of our children. So, three daughters in five years. J&M grew. It was a very good business. I stayed home with the babies because the men decided if the two guys could agree on everything and talk it through and compromise, keep the women out of the business. And the funny part is, after J&M eventually dissolved, years and years later, Bob created a new business and his wife, worked, Ducky, worked with him and was a very important part of that business. Marvin became a business broker. I had quit college to get married, but that was unfinished business for me. It always worried me that I never had a degree. And when all three of our girls, I was insistent, they all get a college degree. I would get on the bus 5.30 in the morning, three days a week, go to TWU until I finished. Good for you. And I got my degree. Good for you. What was the happiest time in your life? I'm, by nature, a happy person. My glass is never half empty. My glass is always half full. And my eyes don't see the empty part of the glass. They always look at the full part. When you were young, do you remember the music you listened to or some of the movie stars back then? Do you remember who your favorites were? Jack and I are addicted to number 68 on the TV. I watched Stella Dallas Saturday night, Barbara Stanwyck, Lana Turner yesterday. We've got all these wonderful old, old movies that we're playing, and we both know these, who they are. You like watching those old movies? Yeah, we love it. Yeah, yeah. Probably from the Turner Classic movie. That's movie. it. Yeah. That's the ones we're watching. Yeah. Marvin passed away. In 1996, in Judaism, the way I always was, believe in, I'm very spiritual. I sit Shiva, it's called, in memory for a year. So different ones would say, I was all of 69 when he died, 68 or 69. And different friends would say, Sarah, there's somebody, wouldn't you go out to dinner with so-and-so? And I said, no. I said, I'm sitting Shiva. If you want to fix me up a year from now, I made up my mind, I must go on with my life. This is what I believe put one foot after the other, and never forget the past, but look forward, live in the moment, and live and know where you're going. And that was the way I felt. And then when was it you met your partner today, Jack? Jack. 1996, Marvin died. One year later, I had been sitting Shiva for a year. In Temple Emmanuel on a Saturday morning, I met his daughter, is Lottie Rep Casillas. Lottie was there with her father, and she came up to me and said, Sarah, I went, you don't remember me, I bet. I went to school with your daughter, Holly. 
she said, I heard you lost your husband. I'm so sorry. I said, yes, it's been a year. Didn't you lose your mother a couple of years ago? She said, yes. I said, I am so sorry. Then she turned to me and she said, have you met my father? I said, no. Um, she said, Jack, Sarah. That was it. I sing in my choir. I sing every Friday night up in the choir loft. When we're through with services, I come downstairs, get a couple of cookies, a cup of coffee, say good job to I know everybody, all my friends, everybody. And uh, he was there. And Jack says, uh, we got ready. I had my two cookies and a cup of coffee. May I walk you to your car? And I said, that'd be lovely. So he walks me to my car. He looks down at me. I'll never forget. He opens the door to my car, leans over, gives me a kiss. Before I can react, he said, may I call you? And I said, that'd be lovely. That was it. The rest is history. Now, Jack, of course, his video is on the website. Right. Jack is a Holocaust survivor. Right. And he goes around speaking, and you work with him, booking him and helping him out. Right. Speaking to her. Right. I do, I do the helping. Once he starts, but I never add to anything or stop. I'm sitting in the audience. I listen. And I'm always there when he speaks in 17 years. My sister Marilyn, who is four years younger than me, has a fantastic memory. Unfortunately, she developed cancer and is not well at all. And she's the only person who checked herself out of hospice. She said, I'm not ready to die and told him, I really don't need you. Very strong lady. Now, in your lifetime, you've lived through so many momentous occasions, of course, going all the way back to the Great Depression, World War II, of course, the Kennedy assassination, um, the moon landing in 69 for the first time, something good, uh, the tragedy of 9-11. Was there something on the national scene that really s stood out in your mind? You go, I know exactly where I was the moment it happened. When Kennedy was shot, Marvin and I were in Dr. Paul Thomas's office for a checkup and for him. The nurse said, I never interrupt you, Dr. Thomas, but I must tell you, President Kennedy's been shot. You're needed. And he was one of the doctors they pulled in to check. Was this at Parkland Hospital you were at? No, we were in his office, Presbyterian Hospital. And they, they asked him to come to Parkland? Come up and check, come check him. He didn't elaborate. They just pulled him out and they said, you'll hear from, we'll reschedule. On 9-11, I was sitting in the doctor's chair getting cataracts taken off. And the nurse came in and said, baby, just hit the building right. in New York. Is there an invention in your lifetime that you went, wow, when it came along? How do we ever live without that? Television, the microwave, what that did for cooking. And Marvin was involved in both. So I was like, and because he was a distributor, wherever he was invited for a convention, they would take the wives. Ducky and I would go along. The four of us would go yeah. to conventions, Las Vegas, California. So much fun. Now you and Marvin have three daughters. Three daughters. You have a lot of grandkids and a lot of great-grandkids. Exactly. What advice does great-grandma have for the next generation? Live in the moment, but never forget the past. It, treasure it. But live in the moment and 
go forward. Great advice. Thanks for doing this today. I've loved it. Thank you for listening to me. You had a great, you did a great job. Really. I've had a great life. <laughs> Good girl.